Well, good morning. Hey, on behalf of the team, so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. How good it is to sing together, to sing of God, to praise God, to take communion together. So glad that you brave the elements to be here. All right. And uh, we believe God's got some great things in store for us. Uh, hey, it's a new year. We're in a new series. We're in the book of Joshua. And we believe God has new ground to break in us and through us. All right, simple question. Where are you going? Where are we going this morning? All right, where are we going in this series? Where are we going um, as a church? Simple answer, not so subtle stage design. From here to there. All right, that's where we're going. We believe that the book of Joshua will be our guide to help us on that journey. Some of you are Sunday school graduates and and when you hear Joshua, you think Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down and you've got those memories, maybe they're good, maybe they're not so good, of Sunday school and Joshua and all that. Others of you may be brand new to the book of Joshua. So wherever you are in your walk, so glad that you're here today and we believe that God has a lot to teach us. When we think of here to there, it sounds simple. Anybody struggle with directions, sense of direction? Anybody there? Anybody live with somebody who struggles? Anybody live with somebody who struggles who won't acknowledge that they struggle with it, perhaps? Okay, I acknowledge my struggles, but I do struggle. I remember 16 years old, new driver, cruise along in my 1976 Sky Blue Ford Elite with the hood from here to the end of the stage there. All right, the big boat. And I am driving on 465, and I'm not exactly sure where I'm going. I have a good idea of where my exit is, but then I realize I miss it. No worries, 465 is in a circle, so let's just keep going. Eventually, I will get there. So an hour later, (laughs) I figured it out. Anybody with me? Are you there? Are you perhaps in a season where you feel like you've been wandering And maybe it's time to get off the exit and go to your destination. I'll get there eventually. As we think about wandering, we think about the people of Israel who wandered for 40 years before their time to cross the Jordan River and enter the promised land. Gary did a wonderful job last week of kind of setting us up for all this, and today we're going to dive in directly to the book of Joshua, and we believe he has a lot to teach us this morning about about our journey. So let me take you to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read the first nine verses, and then we'll dig in. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise... Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the place that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and we ask your Holy Spirit to be our guide, to be our teacher. Many of us this morning are wandering, and we need your help to get from here to there. So help us to put other things aside. Help us to focus on what you have for us this morning. It's in Jesus' name 
we pray. Amen. So it's go time. All right? It's, it's been a period of wandering, and it is now time to go. Verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, I want, I want you to get in Joshua's head for just a minute. I want you to put yourself in Joshua's shoes for just a minute. What have you seen? Well, first of all, Joshua is probably, the, the, the historian Josephus tells us, he's probably 85 years old. Think about this. He is 85 years old. At the time he was born a slave in Egypt, he saw Moses part the Red Sea. He saw Moses do all kinds of miracles through the Lord. He saw God provide this, this manna from heaven, this food from heaven to provide for the Israelites. So on the one hand, he's seen all the miracles, God directly intervening. At the same time, he's seen the people whine and complain. He saw the people at one point when Moses had gone up, up to get to the Ten Commandments. Without Moses, the, the, the people were discouraged. So they took all their gold and they made a golden calf to worship. So on the one hand, we've seen the miracles. On the other, we've seen the whining. If you're Joshua in your 40s, you were one of the 12 spies that was sent, okay, and this is like right after they got out of Egypt, you were one of the 12 to go into the land of Canaan to see it, to spy it, and come back and give a report. 10 of the 12 said, there's no way. Would they, why'd you bring us here to die? Why didn't we just stay in Egypt? All right, we're like, they look at us and we're like little grasshoppers. There's no way we can do this. What did Joshua say? If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land. Joshua and his buddy Caleb, they were the two of the ten that were faithful that said, it's go time, but the people rebelled. In fact, they said, we, we need to stone Moses and Aaron. All right, we're, we're not going. We're not going. How did God respond? All right, pretty angry about that. Strikes down the ten, and he says this to all the people. Everybody 20 years old or older, you will not enter into the promised land. This promise that goes all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you will not enter into the land. Guess what's going to happen to you? You are going to die in the desert. You're going to die in the wilderness. You're going to wander around, and you are going to die. In fact, uh, if you look at the history of this, probably 1.2 million people died wandering around in a circle. Do the math, that's 85 funerals a day. Put yourself in Joshua's shoes. This is what you are walking into. And Moses himself, you have been Moses' right hand, you've been at his side, you've been his general, you followed him. But even Moses himself is not perfect. Moses disobeyed God. It's a long story. won't get into it. But there was a period of disobedience. There was an act of disobedience that God said, no, you will not. You didn't obey my command. You will not see the promised land. So it's over and against this mess that Joshua steps in. One of the things I love about the Old Testament, it doesn't sugarcoat anything. There's not this nice, glossy veneer that says everybody was perfect. All right, it shows our imperfections. What we see in Joshua is primarily a faithful servant in a faithless culture. So that's what we see in Joshua. I want you to feel that. I want you to be in his shoes for just a minute. I want you to step into that mess. Now let's go to verse 2. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. This is a physical place 
of God's promise. When we think about the, the area that God promised, depending on you know, where you draw the boundaries exactly, roughly 300,000 square miles. Anybody from Texas, right? It's about the size, a little bit bigger than Texas. The size of the land that they actually occupied, about a tenth of that. All right, so the land that they could have occupied was like Texas. The land that they actually occupied was around the size of Indiana. All right, so I want you to have that as a visual. Verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. We have a tension here. On the one hand, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you, but I am putting this weight on you, Joshua, that you will cause this people to enter into the land. Can you feel the weight of that? I want you to feel that this morning. I want you to feel Joshua's weight. God promises, God initiates, God is always the first mover, but we have both a response and a responsibility. I would ask you this morning, what is the source of your strength and your courage? At some level, we all have a responsibility. We all have a response. We are all called to be strong and courageous, but what is the source of that? Let's continue. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Anybody want to be strong and courageous? Of course we do, right? How? The pathway to strength and courage is obedience. Interesting what we see in Joshua. We see some conditional promises. While God's love for us is never dependent upon our obedience or our record. Can I get an amen on that? Right? His love for us is not dependent upon that, but yet... He still calls us to faith and obedience. There is still an if-then calling for each one of us. So what's the key to obedience? Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. What's it mean to meditate, all right? If you grew up on a farm, maybe you understand the idea of chewing on a cud, All right, this word meditate kind of comes from this ancient word mutter that has this sense of an animal chewing on its cud, of digesting its food, and this is a long, slow process. Meditating on the word isn't a two-minute devotion. All right, it is letting God's word sink in. It is digesting it over time. What's the key to obedience? Meditate on God's word. Our minds wander. How do I stay focused? I get back to the word. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is God's challenge to Joshua. Think back to that history. Think back to what's in his mind, what's in his memory, and the task before him Now, how will he respond? Verse 10, And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God has given you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor, love that description, 
among you shall pass over arm before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. So this is Joshua's speech to the people. How will they respond? I'm sure that as he remembered, he remembered the past, he remembered the rejection of Moses before. How will they respond now? This is a new generation, and they answer Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment, And disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Serious business. Only be strong and courageous. All right, the next, these eight weeks, we will follow the Israelites on this journey. We'll follow them as they go into the land, as they fight battles, as all kinds of crazy stuff happens. It's an exciting journey. Today, though, we're going to pause. And we're going to ask the question, what can we learn from Joshua? As we think about here to there, what can we learn? I believe there's a pattern, first of all, that will help us. We have a people, a people that is wandering. What do you do when you wander? And maybe you have my image of going in circles. But when we wander, and we saw this in the Israelite people, a lot of times they wind They worried, and they wasted time. They whined, they worried, and they wasted time. So we have a a people who are called from this place of worry, wasting time, whining, wandering, to a place of worship. They are called to take new ground. Now how about us this morning? God is calling us to take new ground, to break new ground in us, and to break new ground through us. And there is a pattern that we believe is helpful, to go from wandering hearts, wandering minds, to a life of worship that is characterized by trust and obedience. What's that look like? What's that look like for you? What does that look like for me? Let's, let's dig in a little bit. For Joshua... It was to meditate on the word day and night. God knows that we are prone to wonder. We are prone to misuse our time. We are prone to lose focus. Joshua's pathway was always meditate on the word. Don't go to the right or the left. Focus here. And that's the pattern for us as well. Some of us to do that, we may have to cut back or cut out certain things to make time for us to do just that. I was uh, taught a lesson by one of my kids uh, last couple of weeks. I love it when that happens, when our kids instruct us. And here's what happened. Uh, I didn't know this, but on your phone, This may be a great truth for you. It may be painful for others. You can actually see how much time you've spent on Instagram, Facebook, any kind of social media. You can actually look and say, I've spent X amount of minutes. This is my average per day on that. One of my kids looked at that and said, hey, in light of that, I need to cut this out. At least for a season, I need to cut it out. I I don't know how he's doing it now, but at least for a season, I'm going to cut back on this. I'm going to cut it out. Some of us this morning, as God works in us, we may have to cut back and cut out certain things so that he has time to operate. To meditate on God's word, to get God's word in me, requires some time. Now, not only does God want to do things in us, But he also wants to do some things through us. I want you to think about that this morning. The in and the through work together. I believe that God is challenging each one of us to take somebody else 
with us on our faith journey. Wherever you are, I think God is calling each one of us to take somebody with us on our faith journey. And the objection some of you may have, but I don't have time. I'm busy. There's lots of things we worship in our culture, but busyness is one of them. A lot of times we are, uh, that's a badge of honor in our culture. I'm busy. I want us to consider that for a minute. If, what if we had an app, just as you can get on that phone and, and, and figure out exactly how much time you've spent on social media, how much time I've spent on social media. I'm looking in the mirror on this too, all right? What if there were an app that said, this is how all of my time has been spent? If I could go back to 2018 and I could look back and say, this is all the time that I spent blank. All the time that I spent watching football. All the time that I spent working out. All the time that I spent, you you could fill in the blank however you wanted to. And I, I weighed that against the time that I spent to allow God to work in me and through me. What if I had that app? I'd be convicted if I had that app. I'd look in the mirror and say, ooh, there's some things that I need to work on. Let me challenge our dads for just a second. All right, I was in the airport a couple weeks ago, and I uh, saw these two dads talking, and they were, you could just tell they were dads of power. They just had that look. They're like in their 30s, and I could tell they're, they're professional, and they're talking about very important things. Little League Travel Baseball. And they're talking about all the ins and outs, and of course it's so political, and they're talking about this kid and that kid, and you know, the only reason he's on there is because of this, and you know, they really, they need another, you know, like a third reliever in the rotation, and all this, all this technical stuff about baseball. And then I look over at the kids, and they're like eight, nine years old. And I wanted to say, really? That's what you're most concerned about. The intensity of your conversation is all about travel baseball. Now, i got no problem with baseball, but where does it fit in comparison to everything else? Think about that app. How is my time spent? All right, I could really meddle and say, how much time did you spend yesterday watching football compared to how much time you've had in a spiritual conversation with somebody else in the last year. Now that's meddling. That may have crossed the line. But what are you most intentional about? What do you care most about? Now that's individually. Now think of us as a, as a church. We believe God is calling us to do great things in this community, great things across the ocean, great things for the kingdom. To do that requires resources, time, commitment, I'm going to step up and do this. One of my brothers on staff was so encouraged. He said, you know, I, I, I've got all these things going on. I'm, you know, he's, he's helping out in student ministry. He's a busy dad himself. And he says, you know what I want to do? I want to start a new men's group on Sunday morning because that's another time that I think I can connect with some guys. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. That's exactly what we need. So it's time. It's sacrificing time. It's also resources. All right, to do ministry, to to expand the kingdom requires money. All right, we need time. We need resources. All right, what is God calling you to do? How is he calling you, how is he calling me to be sacrificial? I'll let the Spirit work on that, but I believe he has a call for each one of us, and he has a call for us as a church. So as I think about my time and as I think about Do I follow the model of Joshua who meditated on the word day and night? What do I need to cut out? What do I need to cut back on? Some of us may say, but I don't know what to do. I'm not far enough along in my own journey. Bryant showed you a card. We got all kinds of opportunities, all kinds of places you can connect, you can learn, You can grow, you can grab somebody to come alongside with you, 
and become equipped to do just that. Do something. All right, all kinds of environments. All right, for some of us, the season of wandering needs to be over. We need to get off the exit and we need to get engaged. And we need to find some other people to do it. It's as simple as that. You're going to stand before Jesus someday and he's going to ask you, how did you spend your time? How are you going to respond? You know, that's, that's for you to respond to. Now, not only does Joshua give us a pattern, meditate, focus on the word, he also gives us a person to point to. And this part's really fun. I want you to see this. I want, I want to take you on this journey. We can learn from Joshua's pattern, but Joshua also points us to Jesus. This is so cool. Literally, he does this. All right, this is kind of like one of those trivial pursuit Bible knowledge things, but number 16, 13, or 13, 16, actually, Moses, it's, 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 it's easy to miss. He changes Joshua's name. He changes his name. He, and I'll butcher the Hebrew, but he goes from Hoshea to Yahashua. Literally, he goes from a word that means salvation to the Lord is salvation. Joshua. Yeshua. Guess who else's name that was? Jesus. That's Jesus' Hebrew name. Yeshua. All right, Jesus is like the Greek version of that, but Joshua literally points to Jesus. Jesus is the greater Joshua. Jesus is the one who will be our salvation. Very cool. Luke 24, Jesus has risen and he's talking to some of his followers. He's on this road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him. And he says this in Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So as we look at Joshua, we look at the Old Testament, it points to Jesus. Isn't it great to know that we're We're part of this big story that points to Jesus. Joshua points to our salvation in Jesus. Joshua's journey to step into his inheritance points to our own journey. And as we're challenged by Joshua's call to faith and obedience, what does that mean for us? I want to take you, I want to fast forward. I want to take you to Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. All right, let's do some big picture thinking just for a minute. So we're New Testament. Paul's audience, church at Ephesus, would would understand inheritance. They would understand the past. They They would get all of this past story. Let me take you to Ephesians 1, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance. That's a great word, inheritance. It's a great word, inheritance. And it's a, there's a little bit of inheritance that says, oh, this is fulfilled and this is yet to come. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So we have Paul writing to the church. This stuff has been fulfilled. You're part of it. Now check out verse 13. In him you also, you also, this is the church, you also, not just the leaders, not just the apostles, not just those who were first to believe, but you also. Who else does that include? You and me. You also. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. It doesn't say when you you did enough good works to earn it, when your record was good enough, when the good outweighed the bad, then and only then were you sealed. It says when you believed. What's the key here? Belief. When you believed, 
you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee or the down payment of your inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we're talking about the promised land, we're talking about looking back, we're talking about Joshua, a physical promised land, and here we have Paul to the church saying there is something we will acquire. There's an inheritance, there's a possession. In some sense, it's like when we were in Philippians and we said there was an already and a not yet. There's a kingdom, there's an eternity that is not yet. Better than anything we can imagine. When you smile that, smile at that. When you go to a funeral of a, of a believer, oh, I take comfort in that. There's a not yet part. There's a someday. Someday that will happen. We are sealed for that day. So there's a not yet, but there's also an already. There's a right now today. So this isn't about just heaven by and by someday. This is a, this is a right now you are sealed. Now, I believe the Scripture points to two options for us. Number one, when I think about my journey from here to there, however you categorize that, I can do that one of two ways. I can go it alone. I can go it alone. I can say, I'm going to rely on my own talent, my own possessions, my own status, my own job, my own family, my own feelings, how people think about me. Whatever it is, whatever that is, I am on my own. I am placing my security Regardless of whatever I say, deep down, I am placing my security in something else other than God. We've got a word for that in the Bible. Sin. That's what it is. Whenever I place my hope, my trust in something other than God. The pathway to obedience for Joshua, trust in God. Obey We'll see that through the rest of the book. That's the pattern. That's one way. But there's another way. Believed in him and you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that word sealed for just a second. What does that, what does that mean? Well, it means three things. First of all, my faith is locked in. I'm getting from here to there there's, a, there's an eternal promised land, there's heaven, there's all that. I, my faith is sealed, it is locked in. It's like a giant, extra strong Ziploc baggie. It is sealed. The second sense of the word, I am authenticated. I, am, I have a seal, I have a stamp of approval that says, Romans 8 tells us this, the Spirit testifies with my spirit that I am a child of God. That is my status that is my authenticating mark. I am sealed as a child of God. I don't have to be a slave to fear. I am sealed. It also means I am sealed. I am protected. I'm protected from evil. I'm protected from myself at some level. That's a beautiful promise. To be sealed by the Holy Spirit. So i got two options. I can go it alone. Or I can walk with the Spirit and be sealed. Now, as we think about this and as we think about this journey from here to there, some of you are wandering. Somebody texted me after first service and said, oh, thank you for the message. I know I need to be back in church. I've been wandering. I'm so glad I'm back. Some of you may be thinking of wandering and i got to get refocused. Others of you, it may be even deeper than that. And you're just hanging on. Interesting, I was... Uh, Somebody pointed this to me, uh, pointed it out to me, but on uh, YouTube, there's a video of this guy. He's on vacation in Switzerland, and maybe your life is like this. He's going hang gliding. There's one problem, though. The instructor forgot to do something very important. He forgot to clip him in. So we've got this guy hanging, literally for his life, literally hanging on for his life for like three and a half minutes. 
can look it up on YouTube, not yet, after the service. <laughs> At one point, he is hanging on, he is gripping by one hand. His grip is so strong, he tears his bicep. He is literally hanging on in his own strength and could die at any second. Somehow he survives. They start off and he's not very high off the ground and then they're way up there and he's just hanging on. Somehow he makes it. Some of you feel that way this morning? As you're going through life, as you're thinking about from here to there, you're hanging on. Let me tell you this morning, you don't have to live life that way. God has something better for you, better for me. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning grateful for your word, grateful for the challenge to be courageous the challenge to obey, the challenge to be faithful, the challenge that we see so many years ago met by your servant Joshua. So I would ask your spirit to move now and work in and show us perhaps what we need to cut, what we need to cut out, where you can lead us into faith and obedience. At the same time, Father, many of us are maybe hanging on, and that's the way we're living. Father, work in us in a way that we can turn to you and we can put our belief, we can put our trust completely in you and we can realize the promise that we are in fact sealed by your spirit for those who believe in you. So Father, if there's somebody here this morning who needs to pray the simple prayer of Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, do that now. And Father, work in each One of us, help us to see you more clearly. Help us to trust in you more fully. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.